I remember I was probably uh, almost out of high school. My brothers were out of high school, probably out of the out of the house by the time this happened. But my dad got us all together one time and said, "I raised you boys wrong. I raised you to be way too competitive. It's just not as important as I thought it was." So he he confessed that to us when we were older that he raised us to be way too competitive. <laughs> Welcome to another Dulos interview. My name is Levi Bimba, and today we have Adam Bishop, high, high school coach of Regent Prep, married father of three, and living the lifestyle of, you know, stop and go all the time. So, Coach, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. All right, Coach. Well, let's start at the beginning. How did you? Uh, how were you brought up? Where were you? Where did you live? Where were you born? And what was that like? I was born in El Dorado, Arkansas, and um, um, mom and dad were great believers great role models for me i have three older brothers and mm. we were brought up in the church and you know brought up to fear the lord and couldn't be more thankful for a, a good christian upbringing like that um, so yeah that's that's where i was born deep south arkansas about 10 minutes from the louisiana border okay so growing up in a christian home and you know, as you say your parents taught you to fear the lord i'm sure you and your brothers never got in any fights it's ah, always pleasant and uh sure. loving and forgiving right <laughs> we fought a lot we were also raised to be very competitive uh, okay. we were all into athletics which is how i got into coaching my uh, my dad coached Little League Baseball, but he was a school teacher. My mom was a school teacher. She's still a substitute school teacher to this day, even wow. though she's been retired several years. And uh, But yeah, we were raised to be very competitive. And I remember I was probably uh, almost out of high school. My brothers were out of high school, probably out of the out of the house by the time this happened. But my dad got us all together one time and said, I raised you boys wrong. I raised you to be way too competitive. It's just not... <laughs> as important as I thought it was. So mm. he, he confessed that to us when we were older, that he raised us to be way too competitive. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't think I've heard that from a dad, but I guess he saw that his his teaching took very well, very well with all four of you guys, huh? Yes, okay. we were all competitive with each other and people around us to <laughs> definitely to a fault. I see. Man. Well, um, Growing up in a Christian home, like you said, did, so was there a particular point that you know you repented and came to Christ? Or some people say, you know, I don't really know exactly. I just know I was brought up in the church and I knew I needed a savior at, at a certain point. And yeah, I was I was an early teenager, around fourteen years old, and and our church that we attended, um, very good pastor was a friend of my father's. There wasn't a day that went by I didn't see my father reading his Bible. He taught. Um, Sunday school in our church in El Dorado and like I said mm. he was friends with the pastor I think from when they were in high school and the pastor was just so solid and biblical and patient with little teenagers like me <laughs> that thought we knew everything but didn't know the Lord didn't know anything mm. and I just remember you know him the, the pastor of our church just encouraging me to stay in the word and love the Lord and I knew in my heart I did not and mm. We had a we had a tent revival one time. I remember outside, uh, we just put up a tent out in a parking lot of our church in South Arkansas, and the, um, another outside pastor came in, and I remember he was preaching. Um, I, I don't remember all the verses that he used, but the Lord really just spoke to me. I knew I was lost, mm. and I just remember saying, "Hey, I've got to come to the Lord. I've got to come to the Lord." So I began talking with my with my parents and with this pastor. And I came to know the Lord at, as I was like about 14, I believe, which mm. is leads into another story. I was uh, had a had a, a very unreasonable fear of water, Levi. Mm. So <laughs> even though I came to the Lord at about 14 and began really reading my Bible, then I wasn't. I I, I don't want to go over two stories but the, the baptism Sorry. story I was I was about 18 before I got baptized oh, okay. another preacher at that by that time between 14 and 18 I started going to a different church mm -hmm. and um, the pastor of the second church came over to my house one day to say hey I know you're a believer and you're you're in, in the word and you're following the Lord but I, I we were talking and I said I've never been baptized and he said well, why not and I said I, I'm really scared of water I don't know how to swim I don't go around water you know and so he came over to my house I remember uh, no one was else with the house and I just let the preacher in I knew him I was 18 years old it wasn't a big deal and mm -hmm. um, he convinced me that he was not going to drown me 
and the water. <laughs> and they really had to win my trust over. So I've been sensitive to that ever since. And people are, you know, hey, you know the Lord, but you're not getting baptized. Let's, let's talk about, let's start with square one. Are you scared of water? Because I've been there. So there, I'm, wow. just, I'm bearing it all to you. Okay. Um, also around that same time, from my 14 to 18 to my teenage years, looking back on it, I wish I had had someone to uh, disciple with me and kind of come alongside of me. I didn't really have that. Mm. I said my dad was in the Word every day. He taught Sunday school and all that. But he was just raised differently. You didn't, you didn't really come alongside the kids. We were kind of on our own. Mm. And uh, as far as reading the Word and doing it, I would, like I said, I would see him doing it. But he was not like, hey, come read the Word with me or <laughs> whatever okay. he was just do as i do as i do and do as i say you know <laughs> yeah i'm not gonna we're not gonna partner together so anyway that was different something i've tried to do different with our kids mm -hmm. but yeah that's that's how i came to know the lord and <laughs> and get over fear of water all at the same time <laughs> well hey jesus changes you right so as you come to christ you got over, over your fear of water and got baptized thank god it took you four years but hey the lord works on all of us in different ways right <laughs> well again i'm bearing everything that's an embarrassing story but that's the truth i appreciate it appreciate it. So um, sticking with your child a little bit, was there any um, formative uh, event that took place that kind of formed you into the man you are today? There were certain things that you look back on, you're like, wow, I'm thankful that I had a father and mother in the home that guided me and led me or had a friend or a pastor, like you were saying, there's any yeah. single event that took place that you kind of think of, think on a lot? Well, definitely <clears throat> my parents. And like I said, I, I could always have the example of my father mm -hmm. and, and my mother was more involved in, you know, this is what you should do, what you shouldn't do. My dad wasn't really that way. You mm -hmm. know, he was um, just not the kind of guy that beat it over our head or whatever. But my mom, she would make sure we were going to church and in, in church and doing, you know, right and not staying out all hours of the night mm -hmm. or whatever, running with the wrong people. She mm -hmm. would tell us, you know, what she, what she thought more than my dad would. So <laughs> that was that was formative early. And then as I got into college, uh, the Lord has always blessed me with having men in my life to this very day, to having men in my life who have... I helped guide my spiritual path mm -hmm. but uh, when I was in college our our campus minister his name was Ben Phillips great guy uh, down in Magnolia at that time he was at Southern Arkansas University I think he works somewhere else now and uh, Ben was just always in the word and preaching at the uh, at the uh, collegiate ministry there that we went to mm -hmm. and um, he was a great, great mentor in college. We would mm. go uh, door to door in people's apartments and all that, just asking them, you know, what do you think about Jesus? And wow. it's kind of funny because we had a church later that did the same thing. <laughs> but uh, I remember Ben taking us door to door to do just evangelism to see where people were mm. with the Lord and making sure we were staying up with memorizing and, and learning verses and applying them to our lives. But he was faithful to preach every Wednesday night was when the college would have their service and he was faithful to preach all the years that I was in college and he wow. ended up marrying Kelly and I he was the hmm. pastor so Ben was very formative um, through my college years is he around the same age as you oh no he's he's older oh he was he's older. older okay yeah he was older than us he was actually full-time at the uh, at the college ministry when Kelly and I were in college I see wow well thank God for a faithful pastor that being in there because from what I've been hearing, a lot of kids go off to college and they lose their faith. They end up, yeah. you know, just going the way of the nuns, as they say, no, no religion, you know, no belief in God, and just, right. you know, agnostic for the most part. But you didn't have that experience, and we thank God that, you know, like you said, He was there faithfully discipling you, and not just preaching, but like, like you said, discipling, even taking you door to door evangelism. Yes. That's pretty rare, to at least, Absolutely. you know, as far as I, as far as I'm concerned. So clearly, you've had a lot of good formative. Um, foundation in your life parents who were saved you had good discipleship in college yes. um, you, you have a, a great wife who also loves the Lord and, and raises your three boys the same way um, but your profession now is uh, a coach and I just want to know how did you know you wanted to be a coach how did you get into coaching what was that story like yeah I've actually known that I wanted to be a coach since I was in about the ninth grade it's kind wow. of funny um, in the ninth grade I had another uh, sort of formative coach who was a believer, uh, mm -hmm. Alan Buchanan was his name, glad to 
you know, say that. He was my coach at two different schools, actually. He was at one school and got fired, went to another school, and I also moved schools, mm. and part, partly just to be around him. And he mm. ended up giving me uh, my first job out of college coaching. Wow. But in the, uh, in the ninth grade, I kind of got to know him and some other coaches in our area, just watching them coach even more than playing. I was getting into coaching even in the ninth grade, and I would study uh, different philosophies of coaching, and I just I knew that's what I wanted to do. There were other things that I wanted to do, mm-hmm. um, um, but I knew coaching was that really close to my heart, and I'd always been around sports. Like I said, I have three older brothers, mm-hmm. so from the time I was born, they were already into uh, high school sports and beyond, mm-hmm. and uh, loved going to watch them. And even after you know they were out and I was out, I would still go watch games when I was in college, and mm-hmm. I would just I would write. Yeah, you know, this is the way I want the program to be when I'm in charge of it, or this is what some coach is doing right and what they're not doing right. And now you write this down personally on your own time yeah, and yeah. just your own note taking. Yes, wow. I, would, I would have those, and I still <clears throat> use some of that to this day. Mm. Um, I'll give you an example at uh, where I work now. We uh, when we travel on the bus, I wrote some things about how to travel to a game, and I'm sure I stole it from someone that I read. Mm. But again, I was in the ninth grade when I wrote it, and mm. I would, I wouldn't try to press it on my coaches when I was in high school, but I would make it as my, you know, my own way to travel to a game, and uh, I, I say it to the kids every year. The first trip we take to this day, that traveling to the game is still preparation mm. for that game. You can't get on the bus and act crazy and think you're going to show up to a game and play your best. So wow. I remember in ninth grade writing that and reading that somewhere and thinking, you know, that's right. So I started writing out my coaching philosophy in the ninth grade all the way through high school and college, and I would read about coaches. Like I said, I would go to games, um, gosh, the Friday nights in the fall since, man, uh, my brother graduated high school, my oldest brother graduated high school in 87, and I remember going to his games on Friday nights, so I I was seven years old then, so oh my I think most fall <laughs> Friday nights I've been in a high school football game high now school for football. the past, you know, 30 <laughs> <laughs> 30 or more years my goodness that's that's i would see that as a blessing though because being so young and already having a passion like that ninth grade you're writing out you know what this coach needs to do what this coach is doing what what you like seeing and even thinking about traveling i know that's something that most people i would assume don't really think about as coaching a football team getting your guys in shape on the bus because it's not just i mean even though it is a game it's still preparation like you said yes. you still need, need to prepare yourself so um did just you know the question's coming to me did you have do you think it was like an innate thing or was it do you think maybe a calling that god just placed in your heart to to go do yeah i think it's teaching and the teaching is definitely a calling mm-hmm. i've always thought that and coaching is teaching you're just teaching a sport instead of a subject in mm-hmm. school and your classroom is the field instead of a desk and a, you know marker board or whatever <laughs> we have now mm-hmm. but yeah that it's definitely i feel a calling and I still, I had coaches that told me don't do it unless you know it's what the Lord's calling you to do. And mm-hmm. I still, I give that advice to young guys now. You know, if you, in anything, if you're just doing it to be doing it, you're going to be miserable. Mm-hmm. So you really need to know that that's, that's where the Lord wants you. And it may not be something glamorous. It may not be something, you know, exciting or whatever, <laughs> but it's where you're supposed to be. Hmm. So I definitely think it's a calling. That's definitely, that's definitely encouraging. So going back to that calling, um, you were the, you were the, pretty much the institutor of the coaching pro, of the football program at uh, Region Prep uh, about nine years ago, right? Yeah, 11. Oh, 11, 11 years, years ago. ago now, okay. Wow. They, they had a middle school program, I think for two years before I came, but I started the high school program and uh, yeah we this is our 11th year to have high school okay so did they bring you on to start this program yeah i would assume so so they knew they had heard of you from other coaches around and i didn't have as much to do with coaching as Mm -hmm. educational philosophy Mm -hmm. Um, i had a really good job in south arkansas at a school called parker's chapel public school on the west side of el dorado And every year, to show you how good of an academic school Parker's Chapel was, they would finish number two in the entire state of Arkansas in the test scores. There was Hmm. one other school that would beat us every year, but (laughs) still, number two out of all the public schools in Arkansas, the test scores. And so um, we were just rolling along. Kelly and I got married. I got in that job um, right before we got married, I believe. 
because I was one year at another school right out of college, and then uh, the second year we uh, got married and lived back in El Dorado and worked on, like I said, on the, on the west side of town, a little community called Parker's Chapel, great community to this day, and um, I was, that's where we were when, <laughs> when uh, we started discovering different educational philosophies, and then John David was born, our oldest son, mm -hmm. who turns 13 tomorrow, as a matter of fact. But anyway, he was born, and we really started studying then, because all of a sudden, man, you have a kid, and you want him to have the best education system, mm -hmm. if it's this or that or whatever. And um, we started uh, reading different educational styles, and we came across, across classical Christian education, which we still love, and that's Regent is a classical Christian school. And that's I tell people, they think I'm at Regent for the football program, but I'm really there because it was a classical Christian school. So mm. I quit my job on the... Uh, Parker's Chapel coaching staff and the classes that I taught there to try to start a classical Christian school in El Dorado and it ended up not going which was a total we just stepped off the cliff you know blind you know just stepped out on faith I guess it is mm -hmm. and didn't work out and the Lord was saying you know this isn't the time or the place right now and I understand now they have a really good uh, classical program down there so mm -hmm. it actually ended up working out okay. for, for both sides yeah but through that uh, Kelly and I joined the Association of Classical Christian Schools which allowed us to uh, see all the schools in the country that had positions open at classical Christian schools, the job openings. Mm -hmm. And Regent was the only classical Christian school advertising for a football coach. <laughs> and wow. so I just called them out of the blue one day and they told me how to get the, um, the interview or the resume to them to see if they wanted to interview me and they did. So I drove up to Tulsa and interviewed and I remember calling Kelly, it's a funny story. <laughs> I actually had two interviews that day because I was interviewing at public schools and private schools anywhere because we, we didn't really have a, a long-term job at the time after I quit my job in Parker's Chapel. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed at a school at noon <laughs> and I called Kelly after the interview and I said, we're not coming to this school. This was a public school mm -hmm. in Oklahoma. I said, we're not going to go to that school even if they offer it to us because they're not committed to what they're doing. They're, you know, they're just trying to fill a spot. Mm -hmm. And then at three o'clock, I interviewed at Regent and I left Regent, and I said, we're, we're going to Regent if they offer us the job. <laughs> and it was just a few weeks later that they called and offered us the job. Oh, and man. they were very upfront and said, hey, we may not even have a football program in five years. Do you still want the job? Mm. There's going to be a lot of first-generation football players. We don't have a facility. We don't even have you know, uh, uniforms. We had, I think, one set of uniforms oh, at the time. Goodness. And I said, yeah, I think, I'll, I think I'll take it and see what the Lord's going to do here. And here we are, eleven years later. <laughs> oh my! So I, I, I would have to think that nine year that a ninth grade um, high school student who, that was diligent in preparing those notes had to be thinking at that time, "I'm ready for this. I'm, yeah. This is this is my this is my my bread and butter here." So were you nervous? Were you thinking that this may not be this may be a little out of your league, or were you like, "Yeah, I'm ready to jump in and, and get started." I was ready. I had been, um, like I said, I'd been an assistant coach that my first year out of college with the guy that I played for in high school, he was nice enough to bring me on right out of college, no experience, and mm -hmm. I just stayed with him for one year, mm -hmm. and then got the call actually uh, from the, the school in El Dorado that I knew people there. I had done some college student teaching at that school actually, so I had an in there. So they called back and I spent uh, nine years there. So I had been an assistant for 10 years before the interview at Regent wow, okay. doing that. So yeah, we, we stayed at that second school for nine years. And then the um, my 11th year of teaching was my first year at Regent. So I had had, you know, 10 years of experience as an assistant and a junior high head coach. So I was, I was ready to step up to high school. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So I would assume starting a program, not everything goes smoothly all the time. Do you remember what your biggest challenges were and, and how did you kind of overcome them to get to where you guys are now competing for state championships? Uh, the first uh, year at Regent, we uh -uh. Um, just didn't have players. They, it was a brand new program for high school. They had had a, a junior high program, but at that time, I'm not even sure how many grades Regent had, but the, the status was when the athletes got to ninth grade, they left. Hmm. They would leave Regent and go to other schools. And so it was hard at first to get them to stay 
So we actually co-opt with two other uh, small schools that were uh, small Christian private schools mm -hmm. that didn't, they also didn't have football programs. And all three of us came together and played under the Regent logo, which mm -hmm. just meant Regent bought the one set of uniforms we did have because mm -hmm. Regent didn't have a field. We practiced at the, one of the other schools. And then the third school actually had the most players. <laughs> I think the first year, the, the first practice, I remember two things about our first practice that we practiced at a church that had a, a billboard out front that scrolled through the time and the date and the temperature. The temperature was 115. Oh I remember that. <laughs> and we were playing back then, we were playing 11 man football and a nine guys showed up for the first practice. Mm. So I remember I didn't have any business cards or anything. So I, I tore out a piece of notebook paper with my name and number on it and said, hey, give these to all your buddies at school. And by the first game, we had 27 oh playing. Oh, my goodness. It was just guys that never thought they were going to have a chance to play high school football. Mm -hmm. They said, hey, we're going to have a chance to play. All we have to do is show up. There's no tryouts. There's no cuts. And so needless to say, that first couple of years, we weren't very good, but mm -hmm. we did have a lot of fun. I, I remember the second year, um, we played our last home game of the year. It was our last game of the year. And we always had to rent a stadium because nobody had a stadium that any of the three schools that we played at. One of them just had an open field that we practiced in. And so the last um, get home game of the year, the last game of the year, my second year, Union actually rented us Tuttle Stadium, the big Tuttle Stadium. Wow. And the kids loved it. And we got way behind in the game and we caught up. <laughs> Oh, and then man. we lost at the end, oh. but the kids had so much fun. They dumped the Gatorade on me anyway. I said, <laughs> "I'm the you know coach that loses a game and gets the Gatorade still dumped on him." And uh, the highlight of that game, though, wasn't that. It was after the game was over, after they dumped a the Gatorade on me. The players went into the locker room, and we thought they were going to come back out. We told them last game, come back out, take pictures with your friends and family. Mm -hmm. And they stayed in the locker room for the longest time, and we thought, what is going on? Maybe they didn't understand to come back out. And we go in there, and one of our seniors had brought a guitar, and they were singing praise songs in mm -hmm. the locker room. Oh, my goodness. And I knew then. I knew, well, I knew before then, but I knew solidified then that, hey, we're in the right spot. Yeah. Because we had only won, like, two games that whole year, and the kids were just in there having having just a worship time in the locker room at the end of the season. That is amazing. So that was, yeah, that was really fun. Definitely, like you said, sealed the deal for, for you, seeing <laughs> yeah. those young guys take over like that and, and worshiping the Lord after a, a loss like that. Yeah. Um, so what do you think over the last few years, 11 years, you say you've been coaching at Regent? Um, I'm sure, I mean, I, I've heard some guys stay pretty rigid in their coaching style. Some guys, they try to change things up as as time goes along especially doing over a decade times of change in, in society and things like that but sure. how have you reacted to that have you have you changed your coaching style at all or has it stayed pretty consistent throughout the 11 years i hope coaching? so i hope i've changed i was um i was more of a screamer and yeller when i first came and mm -hmm. um, the school i was at the first school i was at out of, co out of college it was in the mississippi river delta on the eastern side of arkansas and it was just a uh, it was a place where if you weren't yelling at those kids, you probably weren't getting through to them because mm -hmm. that's what they were accustomed to, right or wrong, good or bad. Mm -hmm. That's just what they knew was loud and yelling. And so the coaches did it. The kids did it. It wasn't always in anger or anything. It was just the way we communicated. And, mm -hmm. and then through um, the nine years I was at Parker's Chapel, I got you know, a little bit better and I learned, you know, there's times to use it and times to not use it and times to get loud and times to not. And again, I thought I knew it all. I'd been coaching 10 years and I come to Regent and I'm trying to prove, I guess, to everybody that I'm the tough football coach or whatever. And mm -hmm. I'm probably the first couple of years, those years that weren't very productive, um, I, I probably yelled a lot more than I should have, which was probably none. <laughs> Shouldn't have yelled any, and I've learned a lot about that. But um, I just, again, I've just kind of had some guys come alongside of me, even in the last 10 years, 11 years that I've been at Regent, and, you know, just to pat me on the back and say, you know, you're doing a good job. And I just started watching those guys and realizing, you know, this, the where we are now and the school I'm at now, it doesn't require that these kids are giving it all they have. Mm -hmm. You know, yelling at them is not going to make them play harder. It's not going to make them play better. They're not accustomed to the yelling and screaming at home or in the classroom. It's very, you know, under control, organized. And so I've, I hope I've gone away from that. <laughs> and I don't, I don't intend to do any of that. I just want to 
uh, get through to them where they are and how they, you know, hear me the best to get our, uh, what we want to do from our minds to the field to get it out there. So, yeah, I hope I've changed. <laughs> I hope I've changed. X's and O's wise, we're always changing to fit the people that we have. But uh, philosophy wise, yeah, I hope I, I hope that's always kind of a work in progress and maturing. Yeah, definitely. That sounds like a, a growing coach, and you want somebody who's going to not necessarily acquiesce to what the players want, but acquiesce to their skill level, their development, and uh, takes critique from people like you said. At least you're willing to humble yourself and listen to other men that are saying, you know what, you know, you, you may need to change things up in how you do things. And some coaches would be too prideful and say, hey, you know, I'm the coach. So let me do what I do, but yeah. I don't think you can build a society, build a culture like you have there, Regent, with that with that kind of attitude. So thankful that you have that attitude of, of humility. But as uh, regarding your coaching, um, you coach at a Christian school now, and you coach at a public school. Um, what I, I would assume was there big differences between the players there versus uh, regarding how they treated you uh, respectfully or um, just behavior wise off the field was there are there huge differences between public and private school in your experience or is there similarities there oh uh, there's both there's similarities there's their kids are kids they want to be loved they want to know that you love them when they when they know that you love them and that you care about them more than just being an athlete then they're more likely to do what you need them to do to fit into the whole program mm -hmm. um, and I, like I said I never was the high school coach in Arkansas I was assistant at both places and what I found out there was the if the head coach has the players respect then they're gonna that's gonna trickle down they're gonna respect the assistants as well if the head coach does not have the players respect then it doesn't really matter the assistant coach is in a bind then because it's hard for the assistant coach to go over the head coach and get mm -hmm. the kids respect they're gonna start with the head coach and go down so I try to do things now as a head coach where the kids respect me and I make sure that they know to show that same respect to the assistant coaches and that's not been a problem at, at Regent but that's the the biggest thing is kids are kids whether they're public school kids or private school kids mm -hmm. they want to know that you care about them more than just being an athlete mm -hmm. And that's, I guess that's very important because I was listening to a, a, a talk show I think it was a sports show talking about coaches in the NFL and how they have to really be, their phones are on pretty much all the time. You're getting calls three in the morning, four in the morning, some guy's in trouble, he's doing this, he's doing that, and you have to be on the alert. And obviously you're you're dealing with kids who are still living with their parents and I would assume are still, their parents are still involved in taking care of them late at night. But um, I think when it comes to coaching, you, you are kind of a, a parent to these children, regardless of how well they, they are with their own parents. Yes. And uh, have you, even notice how you change have you, have you has that influenced your parenting with your three boys at home or vice versa has your parenting at home influenced your coaching out there on the field I think so I don't know uh, specific ways but I I definitely know we spend a lot of time together and it's in and, and the way our program runs in Regent we don't have guys that just play football they go from sport to sport to sport mm -hmm. so I really spend time with them from August through December okay. so that you know four or five months there I'm with them and then uh, in the off season they're with other coaches and um, I'm just trying to be an encourager from the outside but from August to December I really spend a lot of time with them and um, that's that's again that's where it starts the relationship spending time with whether they're your players whether they're your kids at home uh, any relationship you know it takes quality time together to build that so and being at a Christian school, I, I would assume you guys talk about the Lord a lot, talk about scripture and, and, and even maybe do a little discipleship. Guys coming to you, hey, coach, you know, I'm struggling with this issue. Can you can you help me out? And and uh, so do you find that enriching us or does that take place? And oh, if yeah. it does, do you find that enriching being able to talk about the Lord and, and disciple I uh, do. your players? I, th I think, you know, I don't know how other schools do things. I really don't. Um, I say when I retire, I'm going to go watch other schools practice mm. to see what they're doing. But just from what I have been able to observe, we start every practice in prayer. Um, we pray for that practice specifically. Before the practice starts, we pray for um, health and energy and focus, uh, the things you need to have a really good practice. And that's kind of an inward 
focus prayer mm -hmm. and we start on in a circle on the middle of the field and that's how we start every uh, off-season workout or summer workout every practice every game day we start like that and then we do all of our you know physical work and things that we're doing and at the end of the practice we come back to that same spot circle again and then we pray for everything outside hmm. of football we will have it's a very um impactful time i think because you'll see uh 14 to 18 year old boys in there sharing you know this is what's going on in my family i need you guys to pray for this and we take it very seriously it's not a hey you know he's got a messed up home life we're going to laugh at him or mm -hmm. whatever it's a very we're going to pray for him and you'll see friends praying for friends and um it's again outside of our football circle there uh, we pray for family members and brothers and sisters and aunts, uncles, grandmothers, um, neighbors, people, you know, tell us their neighbors are having trouble or um, whatever's going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, we do that. Uh, we pray for our opponents every week. I try to call the coaches that we're playing against um, and build relationships with them. Some desire that, some don't, and that's okay. But I try to know their name at the very least and let them know my phone number and we can talk, um, not just the week that we're playing, but any week. And I've had coaches call and say, hey, we've got this situation going on in our town. Would you pray for what's going on in our town now? And um, even after games, uh, we've had other teams come to us and say, hey, I noticed your team praying together before the game. Uh, when you're praying, would you remember this or this that's mm. going on in my life? Wow. And so really ministering in that way to um, the opponents. So we do, we pray for our opponents, we pray for their towns, their coaching staff, and this is way too often left out, and I even forget it during the heat of the game sometimes, but we pray for the officials. Mm. We think they're obviously a big part, just as big a part as the two teams, the two coaching staffs, the two communities. Those officials are out there, and they are a lot of times berated by coaches and fans. And, mm. and I know people have been to our games, and they may, this. I just remember this last Friday night, I walked out and had a conversation with the official, and I hope I was respectful to him. Mm. We were getting clarification on some things. I was I can say without any hesitation, I wasn't berating him. I wasn't, you know, saying he wasn't good, whether he was or not. I wasn't going to say that. That wasn't the point. Mm -hmm. It was just to make sure we were communicating and going in the same direction and knew what was going on. So, I mean, that's some of the stuff that we pray for daily in our program. And I've even had our basketball coach say, you know, your your team's gonna be praying and that's really good. And he was he was being very serious that that was good. That's what we should be doing. And he said, I would probably, you know, spend that five minutes, you know, putting in a new play or something like that <laughs> when I should probably be praying. <laughs> and I said, Well everybody does it their own way. Mm -hmm. And you can you can definitely put in that new play and then pray after that or whatever <laughs> but yeah we we definitely believe in that part of it well oh, and i find that amazing because i think high school boys you know they're they're playing football they're out there trying to be the tough guys and they're trying to impress you know their family and friends maybe and maybe you know a girl out there in the in the stands but i think the fact that you guys have that prayer time it makes them realize that it's not about them it's not mm -hmm. about it's not even just about the football game, even though I'm sure you guys take it seriously. This is not, yes. you know, some loose, uh, loose program that you're running there. You, you're, want, you're wanting excellence out of everybody. And you already mentioned that your kids want to be excellent. They want to put it out there on the field, leave it all out there on the field. But the, to have that outward focus for young men growing up in the world that we have today, where it's people out there that are 50 years old that still think it's all about them. It's all about their own life, what they want to do, how they want to live. But you're actually gearing kids towards thinking about the Lord and thinking about others through prayer at practice. And I find that uh, very encouraging. And I'm sure a lot of parents in the program are, are, are glad to, you know, to see yes. that and to be a part of that program at, at Regent. Um, but I want to ask you uh, something particular about football. You, you do a uh, eight man football versus yes. 11 man football. So yes. I watched some of your, a couple of your videos on the coach tube and you're, there's, there's still a lot you can do, even though, even yes. though you have eight man. But could you talk about the differences between eight man, eleven man, and, and how the, how the system is run? It's there's not. I mean, the differences are 
usually pointed out by people that don't know eight man football to be honest <laughs> okay if you hear somebody saying it's less of a game or it's not the same game that's somebody that's never been around eight man football because mm-hmm. i thought that when mm-hmm. we first came um i say we because i have an assistant coach that's been with me the whole time we've been eight man and i remember the first scrimmage game we ever had was it was one here in town and we showed up thinking is this going to be real football how seriously are these teams going to take it or you know is it just going to be you know social time and no it was definitely real football and we got into it fast and we learned fast how to adjust and what we found is in 11 man football it's easier to hide because you got 22 guys out there at once mm. um, you can't really hide in 8 man football in 11 man football if you're you know you could you're going to be fundamentally sound the best teams of course but you can hide that a little bit in 8 man if you're not fundamentally sound, the other team's going to find you, and that's why you see the higher scores. People, you know, know that even just looking at eight-man football, um, you know, you just you don't have the guys out there to back you up. If you miss a tackle, they're going to run for a little ways mm. before the next guy can catch them. Where in <laughs> eleven-man, you may have two or three guys stacked in the line there. Mm-hmm. The first guy misses, the second guy tackles. But in eight-man, there's not, there's more open space, obviously, so that's more. Um, slanted toward the offensive side of things um, so that's getting into the x's and o's of it that's why you see you see some high scores in eight man games because you uh, we, we look at it this way you lose from 11 man to eight man you lose three defenders but you only lose one eligible receiver <laughs> so yeah you wow. can you can definitely score points in a hurry which in this day and age that's what kids want it's mm-hmm. like a video game sometimes and <laughs> It's fun, but at the same time, we've had, in 11 years, I think we've had 10 or 11, 12 kids get recruited into college football Hmm. because you just, you have to be fundamentally sound to be a good eight-man football player because you find yourself in so many one-on-one situations that you have to, you have to be sound and you, you can't always count on having, even if that, even if your teammates doing their job, you can't always count on them being there to gang tackle with you or be right beside you if you have to make a play on your own i'm not an x and o guy but it sounds like from what you're saying which makes logical sense you have less guys on the field which means you have less margin for error because you don't have somebody backing you up so you really got to be studying the plays and knowing the playbook and making sure that every play you know especially when you're playing even teams like there's not (laughs) that margin for error it gets a lot thinner out there on the field so um but so so do, do you think um the guys on your team at least when you were first starting out, were they, did they, did they kind of have the same attitude you had coming in? No, is this real football? Or you know, am I yeah. really going to get to experience true football um, I think so. Life? The first year we played eight man, the reason we had to switch, we were 11 man for a few years when we did the co-op I was telling you about. But when we went to just region kids, we joined the State Activities Association, the OSSAA. And that then we couldn't use the other team's players because those other schools were not members of the OSSA and they didn't want to join. We asked them if they wanted to join and they did not. So we found it just being region kids and that was about six years ago now. And the first year we only had 10 players on an eight man team. And I knew right away that it was real. Those kids knew it was real. That was that scrimmage game we went to and we found out real fast Mm -hmm. that it was real. And that team actually now i think they won five and lost five with just 10 players now those were 10 special players we on that group we had a uh one played two played college football on nai scholarships mm. we had one that played uh, basketball at john brown university one that played baseball at neo we had one that got an appointment to the air force academy so oh they're right there five out of the ten guys you can and they see. don't they didn't just play football right no i don't think we had any in that class that just played football wow. they would go to basketball some of them would go to uh, basketball and baseball some of them would do uh, basketball and golf basketball and soccer wow. you know they i don't think we had any that just played football out of those ten but that started it for us with just those original ten guys that fought and they loved each other and like i said we prayed together and we fought together and we cried together and won and lost together and that started the ball rolling for where we are now well, it sounds like they were good they were a good foundational team to launch the program to where it is today absolutely um <clears throat> so uh, well you said bef- you mentioned retirement but you said when you retire you're gonna go watch practice so it sounds like you're you're <laughs> in football for the rest of you know as long as the lord gives you strength and energy to to do it 
no. so you don't have any other aspirations you just want to stick with where you're where you're at right now no i want to retire oh you want to retire <laughs> I, <definitely, laughs> okay. I want to retire okay. i have more time to spend with my with my family with my kids mm. with my wife and you know in that retirement i, I would uh, i would probably get that with over with early in my okay. retirement going to see just what some of these teams do with their practice time and i know every school the culture is different mm -hmm. and but yeah it's it's sometimes we show up at a game on friday night and we think has this team even watched us have they watched our film have they seen what we do and mm -hmm. and sometimes the answer is probably no because that coach is being pulled in a hundred different directions and we didn't talk about that but regent is so good to let me just coach football mm -hmm. and really when they hired me they said we want you to uh, make the best football program you can here and not weigh you down uh, teaching science or math or anything like that, which mm -hmm. I'm probably not qualified to do at Regent anyway. <laughs> but that that's one thing that they do really well. They hire the best people for the positions. Mm. And that's an, another reason it's such an amazing place. That brings me to another question that I, I was reading about or listening um, to a show about when they brought up coaches and um, coaching at least professionally and in, in college, but I think I don't. I think even in high school, especially at a at a high octane program like you have, it can weigh on your marriage. It can weigh on your relationship with your kids. I remember listening to a story about one coach where he was. I think he was sitting with his wife, and his wife was talking about their son's birthday coming up, and and he was like, "Oh, how old is he going to be?" And she said, "Some like thirty or forty. He's like forty. You know, he was thinking fifteen, sixteen years old. But you know, the time just goes by so fast because they're so focused on football. And yeah. unfortunately, a lot of a lot of children don't see their fathers too much and um are you know that relationship is gone so but it sounds like from what you said you're still able to spend yes. time with the wife spend time with your children and still be involved in their lives while being still being able to coach uh, a program and, and do well in in that program yeah well it starts with my wife kelly she is the greatest wife a coach could have i mm -hmm. mean she is always been fully supportive of what I do and hmm. I mean again it wasn't like we got married and all of a sudden I switched professions to be a coach she knew that when we were before we were married we were friends or before we were engaged we were friends and when we were engaged you know I was already coaching and I was coaching when we got married so she knew what she was getting into and she mm -hmm. sought out the uh, wisdom of other ladies whose mm -hmm. husbands have been in coaching for a long time and she can tell you more about that than I can but yeah I know she did that uh, back when we lived in South Arkansas and she got some really wise counsel from some uh, coaches wives there wow. of what to do what not to do what to expect and uh, she has realistic expectations and then coming to Regent um, I can say the the way the school is structured around academics and the Bible that these kids aren't they're not um, expecting or in dire need of a college athletic scholarship which is the way it is at some places with that it's going to put more pressure on the kid and end up mm -hmm. they don't perform as well and on the coaches and the parents end up putting that um, pressure on the coaches I've had a very successful coach here in town tell me you know that he would get calls the day after winning a state championship he won multiple state championships and he would get calls multiple calls the day after winning a state championship to say my son didn't get a good enough scholarship mm. and if you had pushed him if you had done this or you know promoted him to these other schools he would be division one instead of division two or wow. things like yes. that so that the wow. parents really can have unrealistic expectations but in the situation that we're in in Regent the, um, the academics are the first thing above athletics and that really helps to keep it in perspective and you know the the we've had kids sign athletic scholarships I think a high percentage if you go by percentages mm -hmm. you know we've got a high percentage that sign athletic scholarships but it's not the number one thing at our school by any means and that, that, yeah, that brings me to another question because I was wondering if because you're at a school that is so heavy on academics and wants the kids to do well academically does do you think that plays into how well somebody understands football and is able to grasp the plays because it's not like again I was looking at the videos I was like this would take time to study and to memorize and to make sure you're in position and all, all that kind of stuff so I was wondering does the academic rigor at Regent really um, help the, yes. the, the, the boys who are studying the plays and needing to be in the positions they need to be in it definitely carries over mm -hmm. and I, I, I learned mm -hmm. that early 
uh, from coaches that I worked with in public school that if they're allowed whatever this type of school if it's a public school a private school whatever type of school if they're allowed to just coast by during the school day that they're going to come to practice expecting to just be able to coast by Mm. if they're not really having to dig in and you know learn hard concepts and do those hard you know whether it's a math problem or science whatever's going on in, in that room or having a hard test to study for if they're never exposed to that then all of a sudden you know, you've got a hard opponent on Friday night. You're just not used to it, and it's harder to prepare. It's harder to get them ready for that. Where I was just telling our team this at halftime on Friday. I said, you guys are prepared. You go to school all day. You're challenged all day. This is what you signed up for, to be in close games. And, you know, you're prepared for this, and you're ready to go. And I, I love it. I love that the academics are hard because it brings them ready to you know go and they're prepared Mm -hmm. when the athletics get hard oh that's good and i think talking about mental and physical toughness i would think that the academic rigor definitely helps you to be mentally tough like you said when you're in close games and get when it get when it's getting stressful coach adam's on my back (laughs) because i'm not doing what i need to do but i'm still able to adjust to what i need to do because i'm i've been so you know academics (laughs) has been so strongly impressed upon me to to do well and um i think that's I think that's a great benefit of having children that are that are mature enough to you know take the adversity of, of football and and <laughs> based on the academic pressure that they have at the school. Um, so I was wondering, um, going back to the spiritual aspect of coaching, have you ever seen a player of yours saved in your coaching tenure, or maybe a parent saved because they see the the influence that you have on their child and things like that? Yeah, I really think so. I mean, I haven't had them just come up and say, yeah, I just really, you know, I got saved or yeah, whatever. And, mm-hmm. um, I, but I've seen changes in kids that I know it can only come from the Lord. Mm-hmm. I can give you an example. We had a student who um, he was, he was um, I don't know, in a kind of a tough home situation and just kind of brought that to school. And he was always angry. It seemed like with everybody, this was sixth grade, I believe, when I first met him. Mm-hmm. I do uh, I do boys PE in the sixth grade just to oh, kind of get okay. to know the kids and introduce them to the sports that we're going to be playing at Regent. And he was really standoffish and just really angry a lot mm-hmm. at at everybody, <laughs> huh. and no time for you know the Bible and even Regent teaching the Bible verses. I think that the teachers were having a hard time getting him to learn the verses and huh. recite the verses and just really uh, standoffish. And then the Lord really got a hold of his heart, and in through middle school years, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm sensitive to that. That's kind of my area where my heart is in middle school because as I was telling you that's kind of when I came to the Lord and really mm-hmm. started uh, learning the word and, and following Christ and mm-hmm. so in this in this young man's life I saw that change between seventh and eighth grade when he came back for his eighth grade year it was like a different kid and mm-hmm. um, it was it was just like a different countenance on him and you could really tell that the Lord had gotten a hold of his heart and um so that's one that's probably the most obvious change Mm -hmm. that i saw where you just you don't see change like that apart from the lord and then i've heard stories you know parents come to me and say hey you know my my son's really taken his prayer life seriously now Mm -hmm. because of the prayer that's going on within the team or he's seeing this guy or that guy that he looks up to you know really taking the lead in praying and praying for his teammates or praying for this other school or this other person from another town and I've I've had parents say that to me Um, I've had you know players um, I don't know I guess they've just when they're having troubles at home they want to come and talk and pray and cry and Hmm. you know pray some more and cry (laughs) some more and we kind of go back and forth until they're out of that situation but always pointing them to the Lord Mm -hmm. through it all and that's a big big plus what I I did that when I was at public school too um, I didn't I didn't tell you the whole story about my father was a, a teacher for 40 something years and he passed away several years ago mm-hmm. but he didn't I, I was actually teaching before he passed away and he said if you ever get fired you get fired at that public school for preaching Jesus mm-hmm. and so even when I was in public school I, I'm telling on myself now but the people in Parker's Chapel some of them remember this but I got to order I taught health classes I got to order the health books one year, and I specifically I didn't I didn't look through the whole books to see you get sample books, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, I the first one that talked about spiritual health, I said that's the one we're buying. <laughs> <laughs> that's my end right there. Yep. And I remember 
to this day, uh, I would arrange the desk in a circle and we would talk about the different dimensions of health. And when we got to spiritual health, I would let them just kind of go around the room saying what they thought about it. And a girl in the class one day said she was an atheist. Mm. And this is small town, South Arkansas, you know, well, this is ninth grade health class. Another girl starts crying mm. in the class and I didn't make a big deal about it. We just kept going around the circle. It got to her turn and she didn't want So I said, okay, next person. And her mom taught at the school and the girl leaves class. I kind of give her some space and follow her down the hallway from a distance. She goes to her mom's room and she's crying. And I'm kind of, you know, her mom was at the door and the girl goes in and I'm talking to her mom. I said, well, we were talking about spiritual health, but I don't really know what got her to cry. And so she just kind of hollered in there at her and said, what are you crying about? And she said, so-and-so is an atheist, mom. I thought everybody believed in Jesus. Mm, so just wow. even exposing them like that, <laughs> yeah. to, hey, everybody sitting beside you in class is not exactly like you. Oh my goodness. So that was a formative story. I should have told you that during the formative <laughs> no, story. No, I'm glad question, you brought that up. Yeah, yeah that, was a, that was a formative story. But even in public school, I was trying to teach them about their spiritual health. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, I mean, I know, I've heard people say, you know, public school, is, it's a rough environment, but any end you can get into, even coming up, you know, being able to be in charge of the books and, yeah. and the curricula, you know, God gave you that opportunity and you, you know, at least made some impact on that woman and, and very thankful for that as uh, for that as well. So as, as a, you've been a coach for, I guess, all, all your life, even, even though you weren't physically coaching in ninth grade, you were still thinking as a coach. So. Yes. Just people who want to get into coaching, coaching football, basketball, whatever it is, because I think, like you said, it's teaching. Yes. Um, what would you say to a young man or a young woman who wants to get into coaching? Um, well, first of all, make sure that's really what you want to do. Be around the game, whatever sports you're wanting to coach. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, get to know coaches don't be afraid to approach them and tell them what you want to do with your life I did that again with my coaches when I was in ninth grade I would hang out in the coach's office and I wasn't trying to get more playing time or anything like that I was trying to learn mm -hmm. what coaches did mm -hmm. and so I would definitely say find coaches that you trust that want you to be around if they're running a good above board program they're not going to mind you being with them um, and just listen and learn and don't think you know everything like I did. <laughs> I thought I knew it all and probably why some coaches pushed me away. I don't blame them. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it's about relationships just as much as it's about the X's and O's. You can have a really strong understanding of X's and O's and uh, not be relational with, with uh, your players, with mm. your parents, with your assistant coaches, with teams you're playing against um, and really have a hard time and really struggle. And then you can go to the other extreme and be real relational with people and um, really love on everybody and then not have the X's and O's knowledge and, you know, get run off from a place because you're, you're not winning games. So there's a fine line there uh, between being relational and knowing the game. And so that's, that's would, I guess, would be my encouragement would be on the on the relational side make sure you're listening mm -hmm. and and then on the x and o side make sure you're learning um, different systems to whatever sport you play has different systems mm. so make sure you know multiple systems and you're really uh, building relationships that sounds like great advice so i want to end on maybe a little sensitive topic but uh you guys have been getting to the state championships last couple I think you've been to two at least, right? Yes. And but you didn't get the you didn't win, but it, you came yeah. close. So, but I'm sure they still play in your mind. So I was just wondering, uh, what do you, what do you, what have you learned from those experiences as far as like coaching and uh, how do how you react with the players after a, a big loss like that? <laughs> well, I, this is gonna take a while, but I'll tell you. Um, I think it's exactly what the Lord had for us. First mm -hmm. of all, we were we were ready and prepared the kids were ready they did everything they could do to win those two games and, mm -hmm. and like they do every game and um, I can I can tell you exactly kind of what's happened um, the first year we played and we knew man I'm getting emotional talking about this but we knew one of the other teams uh, players had um, an injury uh, they actually had one that was out, didn't get to play against us, and another one that was playing through an injury. Mm. And um, um, like I said, I want to get emotional about this, but anyway, um, during the game, he aggravated his injury, and mm. 
he had to miss some time and came back into the game and they they beat us they were they were the better team and there was no hard feelings at all about that mm -hmm. but um, uh, the game ended uh, we were we were the first time in the state championship game we were probably a year ahead of schedule we only had two seniors on that team but one of our seniors grabs this kid at the handshake line and everybody's done and he grabs him and pulls him aside and starts praying with him oh my goodness. and and wow. so i'm just like okay this kid gets it mm -hmm. you know, this senior just lost the state championship game and instead of feeling self-pity for himself he's going to grab this other kid that just was then the kid that was injured was really good he was a big part of the reason that they beat us mm -hmm. and um, so our kid grabs him and prays with him right there well that wasn't the end of the story either hmm. from a distance the young man from the other town his mom was watching this oh my and so they finished praying and they moved on and the mom comes up to me and she's in tears by this point <laughs> and she says i cannot believe that your your player just prayed for my son after we beat you all in the game he said she said no one that we that team wins all the time she said no one that we've beaten has ever acted like this hmm. toward our guys are usually just mad that we beat them and i said oh no i said you know you beat us because you're you're the better team and we can handle that you know we can we can wake up in the morning and the sun's going to come up and mm -hmm. it's going to be okay mm -hmm. well um long story at the <laughs> end of that night we kind of got with him and a couple of other players fast forward a few months into the summer we have a senior uh, all-star game up at uh, Miami in NEO in Miami, Oklahoma and I got to go to that that year and those kids from the team that beat us there were several of their seniors were there playing in that game and I was actually coaching the other team and they came down to make sure you know they said hi and we said hi to them and everything and, and when the, the, we're together the whole week and we're just getting to be you know close and it was it was just a real again relationship experience where mm -hmm. you know we really got to really just pour into those kids for the week and the game's over that night and then their career is really over a lot of them don't go mm -hmm. on to play in college after that so that's really kind of hits them and again here comes this guy that had been on the other team all week and his mom and she comes up and wants to get a picture of us together and I thought that was the highlight of the week and so he and I took a picture together she took one with my phone I still have it and mm -hmm. still okay so that was in the summer mm-hmm the next year, fast forward a year from the December when we played him and he was injured and we, our kid prayed for him and our team prayed for their seniors and everything. The next December, we're on the same field playing the same team, another state championship game. Mm. And that year, we were probably a little better than them and we had our, our star player ended up getting hurt early in the game mm. and wasn't able to finish the game. And then later in the game, we had another, we were still right with them and another, we had another injury uh, later in the game and they beat us by five points again very hard fought we probably felt worse about that one than the first one because we were thinking that second time we were surely we're going to win this one because mm -hmm. we were you know got a little bit of an edge on them but just had some injuries well mm -hmm. um, the guys the year before that we had prayed for had graduated but they were in the stands watching the game mm -hmm. so i told you at the end of every game we circle up and we're praying for things you know outside of our team mm -hmm. we were just praying we weren't even thinking or looking around or anything all of a sudden the the guys from the previous year the team that had beaten us mm -hmm. they're in our prayer circle oh, with us <laughs> they've got their arms around our guys oh, they're not over with their guys from their town i'm sure they had already told them good game way to go you won state again and all right. this but they're in our prayer circle praying with us oh, my goodness. and that was the second year well the lord knows what he's doing fast forward to this past year so we're two years removed from the first game now that team has to come to play us on our home field in the playoffs neither one of us were quite good enough to make it to the finals mm -hmm. this last year but the way the lord does things we still got to play mm -hmm. and we're on our home field and they come in and they they beat us pretty handily that time and here we are again now there's guys from two years ago in our prayer circle and one year ago in our oh my goodness. so our prayer circle big. is growing <laughs> with guys from the other town oh my goodness and you kind of realize then hey you got an impact of what's going on and then um the one last story about that i told yeah, you there ahead. was a lot go ahead the second year we were down uh seven points at halftime and actually ended up beating them in the second half and lost by five so we beat mm -hmm. them by two points second half but anyway um at halftime 
I kind of felt like, because we'd had the injury, I kind of felt like our guys were down a little bit. So I always like to share this story. So I'm going to share it on, the, on your show here. But um, anytime I see our guys kind of start feeling down and sorry for themselves, and, mm-hmm. oh, the brakes aren't going our way tonight or whatever, I, I remind them we're playing a game in front of people that love us. Hmm. And we're playing a game with people that we love. Hmm. And there's people all over the world tonight that are dying for Jesus. Hmm. You know, hmm. this is not suffering. We are not <laughs> suffering out here in a state championship football game, yeah. playing with people we love in front of people that love us and people that we love are watching us. Hmm. You know, we're not suffering here. Well, I was just given that to talk and my kids had heard it before. And I didn't know, but one of the news channels was filming that. Oh man! <laughs> and that that made it onto Twitter, and I, I wasn't on Twitter at the time. I'm still I'm on, but I never I've never sent a tweet in my life. <laughs> but anyway, so that made it to Twitter, and I was uh, I don't know how what how it even works, but my wife was actually I guess she was the one telling me maybe hey this made it on Twitter or somehow I found out somebody told me yeah and I was just like well that's good you know now people know <laughs> right. what we're talking about and those huddles on yeah. the sideline it's not always hey <laughs> not, this is the first play we're going to run in the second exactly. half you know we're <laughs> saying hey let's don't feel sorry for ourselves we have great lives and the Lord has you know led us here to this moment in time for a reason mm-hmm. but let's keep a global perspective on what's going on tonight in the world and not get so focused in on our little football huddle right. that oh the whole world's about us or the whole world's revolving around us when really it's a very I can't even give you the, such a small percentage of what's going on <laughs> exactly well that's amazing I mean just to just to know that you are in, influencing young men beyond just football and as as important as it is as 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 guys as far I've never played on a team but I've heard people love playing they love the brotherhood they love the, the competition um, but just knowing that you're impacting beyond um, just the f- sport of football with the with the gospel, with Christ, with influence and prayer and, and caring for the world and, and having that global perspective, even when it comes to, like you said, this is not suffering. Um, yes. We have brothers and sisters around the world going through far worse than what we're going through. We should be playing with joy, with gratitude, because yes. God has graced us to be able to um, live in the society that we have and be able to play this sport for fun, like you said, with people that we love and in front of people that love us. So. I think that's an amazing, amazing testament you have going on in the region. And I, I pray that God will continue to use you for his glory and that things will go better this year and uh, <laughs> that you guys will do well in the games coming up. But, Coach, thank you for coming on the show, and I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Yeah.